I've got some questions that relate to the current NHMRC review into wind farms and health. Uh, I suppose I'd firstly just like a bit of a, um, uh, just some background around the 2010 review and the current review. Um, would I be right in saying that the, um, uh, the current review is, the, is an outcome of the recent Senate inquiry into this issue? Yes, it, it, it is, although we had previously already committed to reviewing the, the, um, uh, the literature again, because when we reviewed it in 2009, there was very scant uh, peer-reviewed literature, and we knew that we would need to review it again for our council. And we, we talked to the Senate um, inquiry about that at the time, and. Uh, and uh, certainly reinforced our resolve to do it as a result of the inquiry. And, and the outcome of the 2009 review, well, there was a statement that the NHMRC, I think, put out, might have been a year later or so. Correct. Was the, uh, can you just uh, 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 repeat that statement for me? No, it's too long, Senator. Okay. It runs to a several summary, pages. A summary of the statement. <laughs> well, I think, um, to paraphrase yes. it, is that at that stage, there was not um, evidence that would lead a scientific process to conclude uh, there were um, health ill effects of, uh, uh, of wind farms on the basis of the evidence, the peer review evidence at that, at that stage. However, we, we did point out that if people were suffering symptoms, they should see their GP because this is the way you build up some, uh, some story. If they were suffering symptoms, they felt were due to uh, wind farms. And we also um, made the point that uh, planning authorities should take a precautionary approach and uh, make sure that, uh, as we always do in medicine, I shouldn't be telling you this, uh, that um, you know, we should err on the side of caution. Mm. And so we also added that to our statement. Okay. And the um, timetable with the current review? Um, unfortunately, it keeps blowing out, uh, Senator. Can and. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ignore the Secretary's comment. Um, um, and it's partly because we thought it was sensible for us to invite the public um, generally to make sure that our expert committee, this is an expert committee chaired by um, Professor Bruce Armstrong, um, set up under the NHMRC uh, Act uh, Section 39, that it should we would want to make sure that it had um, before it any evidence that uh, people felt that it should be looking at. So it turned out that was a much bigger load than, than we had initially uh, planned. And, uh, uh, but we have been, uh, um, well, the committee has been uh, meticulously working its way uh, through all that, uh, all that, uh, um, that work. Now, uh, my staff tell me that at this stage, we believe that the, um, the uh, report, the peer review, systematic review, will go to our council um, uh, sometime uh, in late uh, 2013, and uh, it will go with a recommendation of whether our statement should be changed or, or not. Um, so that's not, that process at this stage is not finished, and so I can't um, you know, give you indication of what might happen as a result of, of that. So, sorry, that was, uh, did you, what, 2013, did you say December or September? Uh, um, uh, I, I, fourth, quarter. fourth quarter is what my fourth staff quarter. say. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, we'll, okay. we'll hope for that. We, of course, it'll only be when um, the, uh, the expert committee uh, uh, with observers on um, under Professor Armstrong are satisfied that they are on top scientifically of the of the evidence, so it's up to them to bring the um, report forward to us. Sure. Um, just, uh, just I want to explore this question of inviting the public to be involved. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I mean, it strikes me as a peculiar position for a body that's doing a review of the science to take on what seems to be a slightly separate role. Mm -hmm. which is inviting the public to participate in some way. So I'm interested to, to explore what that means. Uh, we didn't invite the public to participate, Senator. We, we asked them to bring to the attention of this expert committee any evidence that they felt the committee should uh, look at. 
Um, I, I should point out more generally, this is a very usual process for the NHMRC. We, we, we always consult uh, on any, uh, uh, with the public on anything we do. In fact, our Act requires us to. Uh, it says that uh, whatever we do, we should make sure that we're uh, uh, in consultation. So about. just to understand that a bit more, what, what did that involve? Did you simply uh, request them to make submissions, uh, to forward on papers? I'm, I mean, what was the... Correct. I believe that's the case, but I might ask uh, Professor McCallum to answer that question specifically and identify himself. Uh, thank you, Warwick. Thank you, Senator. Professor John McCallum, head of the Research Translation Group. So parties with an interest in this area, which were identified in various ways, were invited to submit their evidence mm -hmm. for consideration, uh, which would then be considered alongside the, the uh, systematically reviewed Review. evidence. Okay, good. And subject to the same standards. And subject to the same standards. Correct. I'm pleased to hear that, of course. Uh, now, you also mentioned observers. Yes, so um, uh, because um, of the great deal of public interest in yes. this, um, and because we already had a statement out, as, uh, as we've discussed, and uh, that was a continuing um, issue of debate, and uh, if I could put it this way, both sides of the debate were accusing others of misusing our statement, um, uh, I made the decision that we uh, would benefit by having observers at uh, at the uh, Section 39 committee. The observers play no role other than observe. We use observers a lot at the NHMRC. All our peer review panels have uh, observers from the public. It's a way that we can be assured, <coughs> apart from my own staff, uh, that uh, we can be assured that uh, the process is uh, proceeding uh, appropriately. But the, the observers here, as the observers at our peer review panel, um, just do that. They observe the process. They have no active role in any way. Um, I'll get on to the observers in a moment. I just want to go back to this timeline. Um, uh, so we're talking about the, the last quarter of uh, this year. Mm. I, I'm aware that there's been some very important research published mm. uh, recently mm. uh, on this topic. Mm. Uh, in particular, I'm, uh, I'm aware of the uh, 2013 Crichton study. I think was seminal work in the area. Mm. And there have also been a, a several other reviews that have been mm. done. I just want to, given the paucity of evidence in, the, yeah. in this field, I, I just uh, would like some assurance that that work is going to be included as part of the review. I'd have to take on notice the specifics about that because, of course, this is at some extent uh, uh, at, at, um, at a PACE committee. This is an independent committee, but they've certainly been charged with <coughs> considering all the peer review literature and to, um, uh, you know, uh, base their finding uh, as a scientific mm. group on the science that's available at the time. There will, of course, at some stage have to be a cut-off sure. period, but we, we face that with all our guidelines sure. uh, and uh, sometimes uh, there's, there's important uh, literature after, but uh, um, I don't know, uh, Professor McCallum may be able to answer your question in terms of the mm. cut-off time mm. for um, the literature. Yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd check your specific items, but they are well, normal I, processes Well, let me put one of them, the sure. 2013 <coughs> Crichton study yeah, is the I'll obvious one. Yeah. 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 Our, our normal process is, as, as Warwick's mentioned, that the systematic reviews have to have a closing sure, sure. and have a different sure. process, but evidence coming in after that is considered separately against mm. the findings of that review and yeah. checked to see whether it uh, shifts the conclusions against of the review. Against the I suppose that my, my concern the in this area... summary from that review, that be specific. The, the big problem with the uh, 09 review is this notion that... Um, what, what, the fact that we don't have enough high-level evidence in, in the area, if, if we have some high-level evidence um, in the context of very little other high-level evidence um, it wouldn't make sense to me to, to exclude that on no, the basis sure. of an arbitrary timeline. No, and Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely, Senator. And, and I can, uh, because of our processes, I can assure you that that sort of um, you know, evidence that would be very important um, uh, can be taken into account. This eventually, th these will not be guidelines for the NHMRC, and so they're not 
um, subject to some very rigorous conditions of our Act. This, is a, this will be, if that's the advice uh, of my council, this will be a public statement. Mm. So between the systematic review and the time of a public statement, uh, we can be considering any other evidence that comes, mm. and it might be, uh, as we often do in, in science, I suppose, uh, have a supplementary note to say further evidence has come to light, etc. So, so um, as you've said, because of the paucity, and I understand that hasn't improved a lot um, over the uh, recent years, because of the paucity of uh, peer review literature, um, uh, we, we will need generally to keep a watching brief on this uh, this. Uh, uh, this area, so that uh, if uh, our views need to change going forward, um, we will need to uh, we'll need to be aware. I suppose my concern is that you know this is a controversial area, as no doubt you're all aware. <laughs> uh, that uh, the um, it's, it may be easier to make a political decision uh, that protects the status quo, uh, in that some of the recent evidence that I think. Um, uh, lens would provide a lot more rigour mm -hmm. to sure. the review would be ignored and and we I think it's fair enough to say that um, the review itself will have more credibility than an individual study mm -hmm. post facto and so sure. a decision could be made to say well uh, we're going to stick with this deadline Mm. Um, uh, it allows us to, you know, not rock the boat too much, and these studies can be considered as an addendum, but ha um, they won't have the same uh, okay. so status as the as the review itself. So, Senator, I don't care about rocking the boat. Um, the NHMRC's role is to look at the evidence and 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 make a statement based on that, and we won't resile from okay. that. If the literature is is rapidly changing, and we are aware of some other jurisdictions uh, doing some work in this area, and uh, and we're I think pretty much on top of what's happening around the world, um, uh, if there's a need to update the uh, the literature view a year from now, we'll do that. Okay. Um, and uh, I can assure you that we will. Uh, with rigour and without fear or favour, okay. uh, make a public statement based on the, the okay. evidence. Um, can I just get back to this question of observers? How many observers are there on the... Um, uh, there are two um, observers. And, and who are they? Uh, it's on our website. Uh, John, thank you for passing that. So uh, it's... Um, middle of the page. The middle of the page, thank you. The observers are... Um, Mr. Peter Mitchell of the Warborough Foundation and Mr. Russell Marsh of the Clean Energy Council. Um, is it fair to say that um, that originally uh, you had Mr. Mitchell on there as a community representative? No, I think Anne McKenzie is the community representative. So you've also got a community group in Western Australia. So just explain to me the difference between a community representative and an observer. The community represents a full member of the of the Section 39 committee uh, and participates fully in all all the discussions. And we have such a consumer or a community member on every single committee that we set up. Okay. And in terms of, I mean, imagine that requires a um, uh, a disclosure statement and so on. Correct. Uh, so is it fair, Mr. Mitchell was never. Uh, a, um, on as a community representative? I don't believe so. No, Senator, that's correct. He was never, he's, he's always been an observer. He's always been an observer. Is it fair to say that Mr Mitchell was originally an observer on his own and that uh, Mr Marsh from the Clean Energy Council was uh, invited to participate sometime after Mr Mitchell's original involvement? I, I, well, we, I, that, I have to check the timing on that, but they were both invited at the same time. Whether they agreed and came at the same time, I'd have to check for you. They were both invited at the yeah. same time? OK. Uh, observers required to ensure that they submit a, a declaration of interest? Yes. OK. So, that's, um, so both Mr Mitchell and Mr Marsh 
would have been required to submit a declaration of interest? Correct. Um, uh, now, I'm, I'm aware that Mr Mitchell's um, declaration of interest was submitted under, uh, was obtained under Freedom of Information, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Um, uh, are you aware that, uh, firstly, Mr Mitchell, who's been a lifelong um, executive and investor in um, fossil fuels, but more importantly, has been a long-term wind farm opponent who is um, currently listed as an observer, uh, failed to declare in his conflict of interests declaration uh, a number of items, uh, including his uh, relationships, both in terms of governance and ownership, along with his families, in uh, 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 a number of fossil fuel and uranium uh, companies, in particular a number of directorships. Uh, are you aware that he failed to include in his conflict of interest declaration uh, his directorship with Lowell Resources Fund Management, uh, Lowell Petroleum, uh, Malopo Energy, uh, Lowell Capital, uh, that Mr Mitchell's son, Stephen Mitchell, is also heavily involved in the energy sector as chairman and major shareholder of ASX Limited Petroleum Company, Petrol Energy Limited, uh, and as a form former managing director of uh, Malopo Energy. Are you aware of those discrepancies? I don't believe anybody has brought that to our attention. Uh, yeah, could I respond to that? Okay. Um, yes. That, that was... Uh, a complaint that came to our attention, I'm sorry. Um, and the detail was declared by Mr Mitchell. I can't go into every specific you've mentioned that, I'd have to check those, but he did declare those in detail. It is, however, our normal practice to summarise that on our website when those are there. We do that for everybody, not just for Mr Mitchell, who was, in this case, an observer, not an actual member of the committee. But he did declare those to our satisfaction. Um, do you in, 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 in some of the detail you've mentioned, I can't. Well, I, I think all of it, I, I'd be happy to if you want. The devil will certainly be in the detail here because, I mean, what I want some maturity is that all of the issues that have been brought to my attention, that he's in fact made those known to the NHMRC in his disclosure. So perhaps I can give you on notice uh, the detail of uh, that, um, that information, um, which uh, I'd like some assurity that all of those issues were, in fact, uh, noted in his uh, disclosure form. Sure, Senator, if you give us those details, we'll happy follow to, it up. Happy to check. And the practice of not listing uh, these interests on the uh, website? Uh, we have a practice that is, is, it does it in some summary form rather than great detail and mm. specifics. And I think we did summarise those relatively accurately. Okay, so I think what we need to do is get... Um, was his um, involvement with Landscape Guardians documented? In, to my memory, yes, it was. Uh, his um, anti-wind farm activism? Certainly, but, yeah. Specifically? So, I mean, we, we rely on the transparency of those declarations. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, it seems like we need <coughs> to pursue that, and I'll be happy to um, table oh. some information that will allow you to uh, pursue that. What happens in the interest Senator, of... Senator, uh, uh, may I just also add, though, uh, uh, that we did hold a workshop on uh, potential health effects of wind farms, um, I think 2010, and Mr Mitchell uh, and, and many others, both from the industry and from um, those concerned about potential health effects, were there. So um, there's no... I don't think it was any secret to the NHMRC or uh, any participant at that um, meeting that uh, what Mr Mitchell's views on, mm. uh, on wind farms were. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, again, I'd just be interested in um, uh, perhaps just Certainly. communicating about the disclosure issue, uh, which I think is important to follow. What happens if there's not been appropriate disclosure? What's the process? Um, well, it's, uh, I think, entirely my discretion to remove somebody who hasn't... Uh, Disclosed. I mean, if it's a researcher, actually, uh, it's uh, um, regarded as a breach of the code of the responsible conduct of mm. research, but we're not talking about research here. It's something we take very seriously. Um, are you concerned that by giving uh, access 
I mean, I understand the tension here that, mm. on one hand, ensuring that people are satisfied that the process has been transparent and rigorous is important, but on the other hand, given the nature of the way this campaign has been conducted, that giving, given sort of privileged access, in particular, uh, in particular early access to information, provides an opportunity for people who are really using that opportunity as an opportunity to discredit the process, um, that you're providing them with an opportunity to do that? Well, two answers to that. First, um, there's a very strict confidentiality agreement with uh, observers and members, so I'd be extremely unhappy if, uh, if those confidentiality requirements were transgressed. That goes for any of our, our committees. People must be able on a committee to, not that Mr Mitchell <laughs> is on the committee, but committees must be able to have very open uh, conversations based on the science, um, so confidentiality uh, is, uh, is uh, very important. Um, and I've just forgotten the second point I was going to make. <laughs> Could I, could I just say that <laughs> I've, I've just checked, Senator Di Natale, and um, Russell Marsh did come on late, although we, we invited them at the same time. The reason for that, we were awaiting a nomination from the Clean Energy Council and took them some time yeah. to I'll give us that nomination. So both, pe both of those groups were invited at the same That's time? Right. And the delay was because of the... The nomination thing. process through the Clean okay. Energy Council. Uh, and Senator, I've remembered now uh, the <laughs> second point. And that is that the NHMRC... Needs some more dementia funds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> Don't be so long to Sorry. answer, Sorry. Senator. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, look, we're very used to dealing with contentious areas. Uh, we, after all, publish um, the code for the use of animals in, in research. Uh, we publish guidelines on assisted reproductive technology where there are very strong views mm. in the community and uh, we really respect the breadth of that view. So on our animal uh, uh, code committee, we have people completely opposed to the use of animals in research, but willing to join us and, mm. and others in respectful conversations mm. around a, a consensus position, and that's what we are working for here on the uh, on, on, on the yep. statement on wind farms. No, I appreciate that. Um, thank, thank you for that um, that information and, and that update as well. Uh, the um, issue, uh, the, the, the other issue I'd like to talk about briefly is in relation to the complaint that was recently filed. Um, uh, against Sarah Laurie and the Warborough Foundation, mm -hmm. um, and in particular the claims that um, she's been engaging in research without appropriate uh, oversight. Um, can you just provide me an update on the response to <laughs> that complaint and what the normal process would be for responding to such a complaint? Um, well, we, we do have a policy on, on yes. and a website about that. Um, most of the complaints we get are around research and research misconduct. Yes. Uh, but sometimes we get complaints about uh, ethical issues. Yes. Um, uh, until this time, they'd all been complaints against uh, about um, research conducted uh, at a university or a hospital or a medical research institute. Yes. And of course, we have contractual arrangements with those institutions to yes. get our funds they have to uh, adhere to a national statement on uh, uh, ethical conduct in human research. Um, this complaint uh, was about a person who was not, um, uh, after we checked our record, who has never been received of NHMRC's funding uh, and is um, at a foundation that has no legal mm, uh, mm arrangement with the NHMRC. Mm. So yesterday we put a statement on our website about what we'd done about this and we wrote uh, to uh, both the complainants and to uh, Dr Laurie and uh, the Warborough Foundation mm. um, saying fundamentally that uh, we, take, um, we take adherence to our national statement very seriously. Yes. It protects yes. um, yep. participants. Um, and that we do urge everybody who might be doing research to ensure they do um, look at, uh, get a human research ethics committee, look yes. at what they plan yes. to do and give yes. them advice. However, in this particular case, uh, we have no remit over no, yes, somebody yes, conducting so research. There. So, so we, we felt that because when the, um, 
the complaint was brought to our attention, we were yep. made aware that it would be put in the public domain. Yes. We felt it was courtesy and natural justice to uh, make uh, Dr. Laurie aware of uh, of the of the complaint. Yes. Okay. So if if it had been a complaint about somebody employed at a university, yep. um, we would record it. We would write to the university saying you need to follow this up yep. and. We'll be watching, yeah. uh, and you need to report to us what the outcome yeah. is. And if the outcome is that um, our national statement had not been adhered to, we yeah. reserve the right to stop funding. Yeah. Yeah. You see, with uh, yeah, sure, with this sure. particular campaign, that. we don't have. Can I ask you though, what would be? I mean, this is obviously outside of your um, uh, remit, but in general, who 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 would um, respond to an issue like this? What would, and it seems to me, a sort of, it's in yeah, sort of. Well, it, area. It, it, um, it's an interesting comment, Senator, and what I've asked uh, the Australian Health Ethics Committee, which is a principal committee in my council, yes. um, to think about this with some alacrity and to give me some advice on yes. what we might need to say uh, to uh, uh, my minister, my minister I'm responsible yes. to, in the future about how we might uh, address this uh, situation. Now, I don't want to go into what might be done, no. but uh, it clearly raised some concern in my um, in my head, not about, about the, the specific, specific issue, no, I but agree. more I mean, generally about uh, the reach of the national statement. What, I mean, there's nothing really stopping somebody calling themselves a health professional, going out, conducting research, Without approval. Well, um, um, such complaints could be brought to the um, uh, the health complaints commissioner in the state involved, right. and uh, that we have uh, indicated that uh, in our letter back to the uh, the complaint, um, complaint yes, uh, yes. in the first place. So I think there are. So there that's are the existing complaints. process would be the state but, um, health complaint commissioner. That would be one option. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you. Um,